the first meeting of the Government Operations Committee and the Committee on Rules and Procedures. Anyway, um, welcome everyone. I am Representative Mike Nelson. I'm the chair of the committee. Um, and uh, we have an agenda in front of us. Um, the <laughs> legislative system will take the rolls and uh, take the roll. And I'm just going to start with introductions today. This is our first committee. We're going to be together for the next two years, so um, hopefully we can work together. And I'll start with myself. I'm Representative, like I said, Mike Nelson. I'm from Brooklyn Park, uh, represented our District 40A. And uh, I've been in the legislature. This is my sixth term. And we can go down with our vice chair. Sure, I'm Mike Freiberg. Uh, I'm in my first term representing District 45B, which is all or parts of Crystal, Golden Valley, New Hope, and Robbinsdale. And I look forward to being on this committee. Hi, everyone. Joyce Pepin. I'm in my fifth term, my second term on government operations, and look forward to continuing service on the committee. Hi, Steve Draskowski from Mazeppa, House District 21B, uh, featuring portions of Wabasha, Goodhue, Winona, and Dodge Counties. And uh, they say fourth term, uh, six year, uh, kind of one of those hybrid uh, special election cases. Uh, good morning. My name is Ryan Winkler. I represent Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, Plymouth, and the community of Medicine Lake. This is my fourth term and my fourth term on the Government Operations Committee. And so, Mr. Chair, I don't know if uh, maybe I outrank you. I can't remember if you were there. Uh, in 2007 session or not? Uh, no, this no. I have. I was in 2007. I was on local government, but I wasn't on government operations. So, aside from Mr. Shepard, I'm the ranking member, and maybe Ms. Dyson, <laughs> I'm the ranking member on the committee. Well, thank you for that history. Uh, Representative Tim O'Driscoll, 13B, uh, second term and uh, second stint on government operations. Good morning, everyone. Cindy Pugh, representing 33B from Chanhassen. Uh, my district includes um, the Greater Lake Minnetonka area, um, Deep Haven, Shorewood, Greenwood, Spring Park, Excelsior, Tonka Bay, Mound, and Minnetonka Beach. And this is my first term. I am Joe Marble. I'm the uh, committee GOP uh, researcher. Uh, I covered the GovOps committee from 2007 to 10 as well. Didn't last session. I did stick up finance, but look forward to it. Thanks. And our new, newest member just arrived. Oh, don't fall over. <laughs> we're just, we're just introducing, introducing ourselves. Huh? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, David Dill, okay, representative from my district uh, 3A. And I represent Coochiching, St. Louis Lake, and Cook County, which is a lot of uh, about 14,000 plus square miles. <coughs> I'm Joanne Ward representing District 53A, which is Western Woodbury, South Maplewood, South Oakdale, all of Landfall, and um, first term. Uh, Zachary Dorholt, uh, represent 14B, which is half of St. Cloud and Minden and Haven Townships. Dwayne Quam, uh 25A, part of Dodge, part of Olmstead County, uh, second term on uh, this committee. And I've got uh, townships, small towns, and up through, including part of the third largest city in the state. So I enjoy uh, local government. I'm Deb Dyson from House Research. Mark Shepard from House Research. Um, my name is Tim Gaphart, and I'm the committee legislative assistant. Jim Geldman, committee administrator. Gillis. Want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, Phyllis Kahn, state representative from around the University of Minnesota. And the last committees I were on went until just about now. So apologize for being late. And I did chair this committee once in the past at one time. And it's a terrific committee, particularly for new members of the legislature. If you want to learn what this, how the state works and what the state is about, this is about the best possible committee for you to be on. And I'm you know, sure that the new chair will take um, great opportunity to see that you do. Thank you. And uh, Representative Falk, you want to introduce yourself. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and this is my first opportunity, opportunity serving on this committee, so thank you for the uh, 
chance to work on these issues. I represent District 17A, which is West Central Minnesota, Swift, Chippewa, Renville, and part of Candy Way counties, and looking forward to a successful couple of years here. Thank you. And in your, agen in your packet, you'll find the agenda, um, and then also in your packet, you'll find a, a printed list of rules. Um, just for your, read them at your leisure. Um, one thing I, I ask is, and I think other committee chairs say this, we're, we're being recorded, and a lot of times, if you have your cell phones on, even on silent, sometimes they interfere with this. So if you can turn them off, turn them off. But it, at least put them on silent so we don't hear ringing during the middle of the committee. That can be distracting. Um, everyone, just so everyone's aware, that this committee moves back and forth. On Tuesdays, we'll be here in room five. Um, Wednesdays, we'll be in the basement hearing room. So just be aware of that, that we move back and forth and watch your schedules, your calendars, make sure that they have that on there. Um, also in your package, you'll find a save folder. Anything you want saved, make sure you put in that save folder. And with that, I think that's all the housekeeping when you do. Um, I'd like to call on uh, represent, or excuse me, on Mark Deppert, Shepard and Deborah Dyson to give us an overview of the, what, what our, current, our committee jurisdiction is. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Mark Shepard from House Research. I'll start off, and then uh, Deb is going to um, finish up. Generally, um, I work with this committee on the state government half of the committee's responsibilities, and Deb generally handles the local and metro. So if you have any questions or bill drafts, amendments, anything, please um, let us know. Um, the the uh, Governmental Operations Committee is interesting in that there's a House rule that assigns the committee um, mandatory jurisdiction over certain bills. And that's uh, currently House Rule 4.13. Um, the rules, of course, sometimes change from um, biennium to biennium, so I'll be talking about the rule as it exists today. But it, that rule gives uh, this committee jurisdiction over a bill that either um, establishes or reestablishes state agencies that um, delegates rulemaking authority to state agencies or that exempts an agency from rulemaking or that substantially changes the organization of a state agency. So a lot of the bills that come before this committee deal with one of those topics, um, government organization or rulemaking. And especially as the committee deadlines approach um, as the session goes on, uh, the committee typically gets a lot of bills re-referred to it um, from other committees. And the subject matter can be um, really varied. It, it goes across the board um, from transportation to natural resources to um, lots of other things. Uh, so it it's always uh, seems to be something new every day. Um, the rule requires that these bills be re-referred to this committee um, before they're given their second reading. As the, as the rule currently stands, <clears throat> there's exemptions for the omnibus finance bills and uh, some exemptions for other finance bills. But otherwise, uh, the committee gets a lot of re-referrals. So um, one of the things that, uh, one of the kind of bills that the committee hears are bills that deal with rulemaking. Um, rulemaking, uh, when, an agent, when a state agency is making general policies to implement a law that you have enacted, that has to be adopted through a formal rulemaking process. And agencies don't have inherent authority to make rules. They only have the authority that the legislature grants to them. So when there are bills that are granting rulemaking authority to state agencies, they come before this committee. And typically, the committee has examined those bills and asked, is, is this a good idea to give this lawmaking power to state agencies? Or is it something the legislature wants to do itself? And if it is a good idea, is the delegation of authority the way that you all want to see it, is so that you're not surprised by the rules that come back from the agency. Sometimes um, agencies will come in and ask for an exemption from the customary rulemaking process. Um, in the usual rulemaking process, a state agency has to give notice. They have to give opportunity for a public hearing. The rules have to be reviewed by uh, an administrative law judge at the independent Office of Administrative Hearings before they take effect. And there's, there's various other steps in the process. And uh, there are times when agencies have to act more quickly 
than is possible through the customary rulemaking process. Uh, for example, uh, and Representative Dill is familiar with this, uh, the, the DNR often in its game and fish uh, in setting seasons and in making other regulations that are uh, dependent on wildlife population or fish population doesn't have time to go through a month or a year long rulemaking process. And so they uh, have come to this committee and asked you for authority to set those policies without going through the formal rulemaking. So in those instances, the committee is, <coughs> is trying to decide if the, uh, if the rulemaking exemption is justified and if there's enough opportunity uh, through a different means for the public to have input into the rules. Uh, in the memo that's in your packet, there are some links to um, short papers that um, House Research has prepared that describe uh, the rulemaking process in, in more detail than, than I'm going to do today. Um, another kind of bill that the, the committee uh, typically hears is bills that are either uh, creating or changing state agencies. Um, sometimes these will be advisory groups that are created to um, assist uh, cabinet level agencies in their duties. And when those kind of bills come before the committee, traditionally um, the kind of questions that have been asked are, um, is there a need for the, a group like this to exist at all? Why do we need an advisory group? Uh, if, if a group is needed, um, who appoints the members? What are their terms? What are the grounds for removal? Should the members get paid per diem or expenses? Um, should the group expire at a prescribed time? And again, these uh, the kind of uh, subject matters covered by these groups tend to range across all the state governments. So one day you might be hearing a bill that deals with a human services topic and the next day with agriculture or transportation or something else. It's quite, quite varied. But these are bills that House rules require must uh, be re-referred to the Governmental Operations Committee. Um, there's other topics that are not um, mandatory re-referrals to the committee, but that have traditionally been within its jurisdiction. Um, one of these is um, legislation that deals with state contracts. Um, sometimes these have dealt with procedures that state agencies have to follow to enter into contracts for professional or technical services. Other times, um, agencies, uh, the legislature has wanted to uh, give uh, certain kinds of preferences to uh, certain groups in contracting or has wanted uh, environmental considerations taken into account in state contracting or has otherwise wanted to uh, write laws that govern how state agencies buy goods and services. Um, another topic is um, state employee compensation. Um, the, the legislature has written the laws that determine how state employees are compensated. About 90% of executive branch employees are unionized and the legislature has written the laws that govern uh, the uh, establish the bargaining units for those employees and the process for the unions to negotiate with the commissioner of management and budget to set their uh, terms and conditions of employment. So if there are uh, changes, any proposed changes in those laws, uh, those often come before those committees, uh, this committee. And uh, sometimes the committee is assigned jurisdiction to review uh, the bills that implement any collective bargaining agreements or compensation plans for state employees. Uh, other times, sometimes those bills go to the state government finance committee, sometimes here, and, and I'm not sure how that'll be handled this year. Um, the last topic um, that I wanted to mention, Mr. Chair, is, is the topic of public pensions that uh, Larry Martin from the Pension Commission is going to be discussing more fully in, in just a few minutes. Um, there, there's an unusual legislative structure for dealing with pension bills. There's a joint House-Senate uh, commission called the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement. It's made up of seven members from the House and seven members from the Senate, and they typically hear in, in great detail all the pension bills and then put together one or more omnibus bills that then comes in front of this committee uh, for consideration. And so. Um, the Government Operations Committee has jurisdiction to hear uh, the pension bills and, and usually, um, in most cases, defers to the Pension Commission before doing that. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's, that's all I'm going to say about the state government side of things, and uh, Ms. Dyson will uh, talk about local and regional government.
Thank you, Mr. Shepard. And go ahead, Ms. Dyson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. I'm the House Research Analyst that uh, covers local and metropolitan government issues. And as the memo uh, that was handed out to you says, uh, beginning on page four, this committee typically hears bills relating to the governance powers and duties of local and regional government as opposed to the public finance and tax issues that are in front of the tax committee. Um, to give a snapshot of look at local and metropolitan government organization, I provided a uh, two-page handout that is from the soon-to-be-released Minnesota Government in Brief uh, booklet that House Research publishes uh, each biennium. Uh, it provides uh, just a brief overview of local government structure, um, some numbers, the number of counties, cities, towns, and uh, the governance structures for those. And then on the other side, the metropolitan government uh, with the metro agencies information. Uh, beginning on page four of the memo that uh, Mr. Shepard and I provided to you, there's an overview of state and local relations that gives the basis for legislation that you might see in this committee relating to local and metropolitan government. The state constitution actually provides the basis for that, uh, beginning with that the legislature can provide by law for the creation, organization, administration, consolidation, division, and dissolution of local government units and their functions, provide for changing boundaries, and uh, providing for the elective and appointed officers, including qualifications for office, office and transfer of county seats. Um, the thing to note about changing um, county boundaries and county seats is that that requires approval of the voters uh, voting on the question, um, which as a constitutional matter. The next point I wanted to make is that Minnesota follows what's known as Dillon's Rule, and the rule states that local governments possess only those powers that are conferred by statute or implied as necessary to carry out legislatively conferred powers. Uh, the name of the rule comes from the name of an Iowa judge from the 1800s, uh, but basically what it means is in thinking about legislation that, the, uh, that you might want to pursue, the starting question is, what uh, law already authorizes a government action as opposed to what law prevents it. You need to, uh, legis local governments need authority in law to act. Um, it's not an inherent authority that they have that, that we prevent them from acting on. Uh, the Dillon's rule is uh, mitigated in its severity by two actions that the legislature has taken over time. One is the uh, authority for cities to adopt home rule charters. The Constitution allows the legislature to authorize any local government to adopt a home rule charter, but at this time only cities have general authority to establish uh, home rule charters. And then the other is the authority of cities and towns to legislate for the general welfare. A home rule charter is a local constitution, essentially, and it pr can provide for not only the governmental organization of a city, but also for the substantive authority to be exercised by the governing body for the community. It has to be consistent with the state constitution and state law um, can override a charter provision. And the other thing to, uh, cities have to do in adopting a charter is that it has to be approved by the voters. The only, there's only one county in the state that has a home rule charter and that's Ramsey County and that was by special law in, the, in 1987, I believe, and it was approved by the voters in 1990. Uh, there have been a couple of proposals in recent years for some other uh, counties in central Minnesota to establish home rule charter, but um, for various reasons that those bills haven't uh, proceeded. The other uh, authority in le law for that um, mitigates that um, severity of the Dillon's rule is the ability to adopt ordinances for the general welfare. And cities have uh, this authority and towns do. Counties do not have general welfare authority, although there is a um, statute in the health laws that counties sometimes use to um, it provide for the general welfare within the context of that statute. So within that um, broad state-local relationship, um, you, you're going to see two different kinds of bills in this committee relating to local and metropolitan government. First is general legislation, and general legislation affecting all local units of government within a stated class, um, for example, all counties, or all towns in the seven county metro area, or all cities, or cities of a particular class. 
and the types of bills that have come before the committee in the past um, along these lines in general law relate to purchasing and contracting, much like with state government, employment um, of uh, municipal employees, exercising joint powers and other forms of cooperation, boundary adjustments, that's the annexation, detachment, consolidation of, uh, lo of uh, cities and towns, and then uh, mandate relief has been a topic sort of in a broad sense that has been before the committee in the past. Land use, planning and zoning, um, eminent domain, open meeting law, uh, subjects like that. And some of these overlap with other committees, but um, will either uh, originate in this committee or come to this committee at some point. The other type of legislation relating to local government that you'll see in this committee is special legislation. And that's special legislation is when it uh, the bill affects a particular member of a class, so a particular city or county or town. And that it's often the case that the um, local unit of government is seeking some authority but doesn't want to affect all units of government within that um, class, all cities. They want it just for that one city. And um, part of the questions that you'd be asking is why just this city, why not everyone? An example um, that seems to come up almost every year is a bill that would authorize a county to change certain offices from uh, elected positions to appointed positions. Special, special legislation must be approved by the local unit of government unless an exception applies. And general law provides three exceptions. One is that it's permissive. In other words, if you're granting authority, why would you require it to be approved at the local level since it's still discretionary whether they um, pursue that authority. However, the legislature sometimes wants to impose um, the local approval requirement. Uh, maybe it's to cut off the time limit for uh, when the authority is exercised since local approval has to be completed within the biennium. Um, another e exception is for units of government with over one million population, and this affects the metropolitan agencies. and. At this point, um, the uh, Hennepin County. Hennepin County is over one million population, is no longer subject to the uh, local approval uh, requirement. Uh, and then the third is a special law that's essentially bringing the unit of government into compliance with general law, either by repealing some exception to it or something like that. So the, um, as Mr. Shepard mentioned, the memo that we provided provides some uh, web addresses uh, to publications from House Research on these topics. Uh, also included is the Legislative Reference Library's Links to the World link for the local government section, since there's some very good resources there on topics relating to local and metropolitan government. And that concludes what I wanted to provide to the committee, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Dyson. Um, is there anybody have any questions of um, Mr. Shepard or Ms. Dyson of Representative Poppy or Pepin? <laughs> <laughs> I just saw the piece, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Shepard. Um, Mr. Shepard, the memo uh, from the two of you lists the mandatory jurisdiction under House rules, and then it lists House Rule 4.13. <laughs> with ABC and then another section, is that, does that reflect the entire, I don't have a copy of the rules book, but does that reflect the entire section of rules? Is it, a, is it an exact copy or are there changes? Mr. Shepard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Pepin, this is an excerpt. Um, the, uh, the parts that are an exact copy are the text of paragraphs A through C. That, that is copied exactly from the rule, but the next paragraph that talks about the exceptions is, is sort of my summary of it. It's not the exact text of the rule. Thank you. Uh, Representative Kahn. Yeah, Mr. Chairman and members, one of the um, things that I realized from serving on this committee is that you have an extra special uh, charge, which is every other committee that you're on, you need to be alert for these. I, I know that our staff will be incredibly alert to try and find them, but it's really very helpful if you're alert in the other committees that you share, that, that you serve on, of authors who are trying to avoid this rule. And you bring it up and remind them then, and then also, of course, go to the committee chair who can just pull it right from the floor. But reminding people that it's much better to deal with it properly than to have 
have to have their bill yanked from the floor is a good idea. So that's an extra charge that you, that your GovOp badge gives you in every com other committee that you serve on. Thank you, Representative Tan, <laughs> and that's good advice because uh, especially if you have a bill that you want to get passed and it's if we're past deadlines or getting to deadlines, um, so we can get it get it heard so we don't yeah. end up killing something inadvertently. Representative Kahn. Uh, and I'm not sure how much this has been done. Maybe Mr. Shepard is the best on it. But uh, uh, um, how often do we have rules change to things that are really rules but just have another word so that it doesn't trigger this rule? How, how, how do we work on that problem? Mr. I know it's come up, but I can't remember what the solution has always been. Mr. Shepard. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Representative Khan and members, uh, Representative Khan is referring to a bill in which uh, okay. that purports to give an agency authority to adopt policies or guidelines or something <laughs> else with binding effect. But if those are going to be binding, they need to be adopted as rules through the rulemaking process. And so um, if, if you're on another committee and you see something like that, it either, and, and if I'm advising an author, I would try to tell them that if you want the agency to have authority to actually make something that has the force and effect of law, it has to be a rule and it has to go through the rulemaking process and, and it should say a rule. And, and uh, if it does say a rule, then, then of course the, re the bill would need to be re-referred to this committee so you all could consider whether that delegation of authority is proper. So something, uh, the way the statutes uh, have been enacted, if, if it's an age, a state agency statement of general applicability that's made to implement the law, then it has to be adopted as a rule, e even if somebody's trying to call it a guideline or a policy or a, some other word like that. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Any other questions? Representative Hansen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry I came in late, but I, I was intrigued by something Representative Khan said. So we get badges? in this committee? Is that <laughs> it's a, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Representative Kahn. First of all, some people say serving on this committee is not an award but a sentence. <laughs> but what it is, it's just a mental internal badge that you carry that lists you, that considers you to be the enforcer of the GovOp rule, among other things. <laughs> Representative Dill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Shepard. If you're correct that the environment area is well known for sending stuff here. So I want to make sure so that a, a, a rule that is proposed to be made, an expedited rulemaking process, and um, one more thing. Relief from the rules. My, there's three things that we normally in environment deal with. Uh, rule, expedited rule, and exemption. Even in, an ex in, even in the case of exemption, the bill would travel to this committee. Uh, Mr. Dice, Mr. Mr. Shepard, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Dill, that that is correct, and and for that reason, um, you know, Representative Dill and and other um, legislative authors of the Game and Fish Bill have the the, the the DNR typically is asking for authority either that that affects rulemaking, and so that <clears throat> bill quite often is, is re referred to this committee, and the committee wouldn't consider the whole Game and Fish policy, but just. Uh, usually one of the staff here would try to direct your attention to the uh, usually very limited number of provisions that are within the jurisdiction of the committee. Yep. Representative Winkler. And Mr. Chair, and just because we have the Chair of the Legacy Committee here, <laughs> I thought I would mention one particular issue that came up last year that I'm sure will, will uh, require that the Legacy Bill come through government operations, which is sometimes we have these special uh, citizen commissions that think that they have lawmaking or policy making authority and we put that lawmaking or policy making authority uh, grant in, in state law through the legacy bill um, which is completely unconstitutional um, even though it keeps getting signed into law and they keep exercising it so I'm sure that with the chair of the legacy committee sitting on GovOps this year we will not have anything similar to that going on in the future well, with the former chair of GovOps, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> with the former chair of GovOps sitting by my side, also a member of the Legacy Committee, I'm sure we'll have a good time looking at that. <laughs> <Don't comment>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two more members have come in since we introduced ourselves. Uh, Representative Sanders, if you would give a brief introduction of yourself and, and where you're from. 
Good morning, Representative Tim Sanders, House District 37B, which is Blaine. Thank you, This will be my third time on the committee. Representative Hanson. Uh, Representative Rick Hanson, I represent South St. Paul, West St. Paul, Mendota Heights, Mendota, and Lilydale. Thank you. And with that, any more questions or inquiries? Otherwise, we'll call on uh, Mr. Lawrence and uh, Mr. Burdick to come and tell you if he's here to talk about pensions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Larry Martin from the staff of the Pension Commission. I've been asked to give you an overview and a sense of what is going on in, in Minnesota pensions, uh, the structure of, of our pension plans, their uh, funding health, um, and some pertinent information. You have a packet in your folders um, that I've prepared that uh, covers it in more detail than I'm going to be able or want to um, get into. Um, I've given you this amount of information in part to help answer questions perhaps um, as you have them and um, to give you some information that may be of some interest to you um, at, when you have a, a free moment. Um, Mr. Shepard noted that the Pension Commission, the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement is a somewhat unique um, entity in, in state government um, as a, a joint a, a commission and I, I plan to start there. There's a on, um, page one of your document, there's a, a little bit about the Pension Commission. It's been around in some form or another since the 1940s, um, not always continuously, um, and it's been in its current um, uh, status as a permanent commission of the legislature since um, 1967. Um, the commission is made up, as Mr. Shepard noted, uh, seven members of the House and seven, seven members of the Senate in a uh, heartening uh, development um, different from past uh, decades. The Pension Commission was actually appointed yesterday. Um, it usually occurs in February or March, uh, making the first uh, session, first year of the legislative session more entertaining for both the members of the Commission, I'm, I'm sure, and for this committee um, because it delays the work product of, of, of the Pension Commission potentially. The Pension Commission, well, pensions were not always part of this committee's total jurisdiction, or at least not all pensions were. Uh, historically, if you look at um, going going back to the um, 19th century or the, or the 20th century, um, pensions tended to follow what the employee covered by the pension plan, um, what, where they landed. So judicial pensions ended up in the Judiciary Committee, teachers' pensions ended up in the Education Committee, um, police and fire probably ended up in the public safety committees and so on. Um, it's only been in, in um, the last few decades perhaps um, that pensions have been consolidated or the, the look at the legislative oversight and supervision of public pensions has been in, in your committee, once called civil administration and now called governmental operations. The Pension Commission um, in its um, back in the 60s and 70s really function as the joint subcommittees of the House and Senate on pensions. And indeed the membership of, of the Pension Commission in those uh, decades was drawn from this committee um, and from the counterpart Senate committee. Um, that's not been the case for some time now. Uh, members of the Pension Commission are, are drawn from the legislature more broadly, not just from, from this body, um, not just your committee. and. Um, the, this committee is not um, regularly anymore uh, appointed a, 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 a pension subcommittee. The Pension Commission um, works as an advisory entity to you um, and to the legislature broadly. Uh, the Pension Commission does not have jurisdiction of the actual bills where our jurisdiction is more uh, conceptual. We, we look at and handle public pension issues um, whether or not the bill has been formally um, sent to the Commission. Indeed, there, there is no referral of, of a bill directly to the Pension Commission. Um, it's referred to your committee and the Pension Commission. Um, we're notified um, by your committee that you, you have a uh, pension bill and, it, and, and we keep track of it, um, but we're not the former holders of, of pension bills. Your committee is. What the Commission has done in, in the last uh, couple of decades is to formulate the, its, its recommendations uh, in an omnibus bill or sometimes a couple of omnibus bills. 
and that would be my anticipation of for this session. Um, the, the pension commission will be chaired by a, a Senate member, um, and the chairs, uh, the uh, chair is elected by by the pension commission. So there will be an organizational meeting of the pension commission shortly, and there will be a chair chair uh, ought to be elected at that point. And but my expectation is that we again will be assembling omnibus pension bills for your consideration. Um, <clears throat> on page. Um, Five of, of your, um, I'm sorry, page three of your uh, handout. There's something called the the principles of pension policy. I'm not going to go through them in, in detail, but this three or four pages that you you you, you have here represents the cumulative wisdom of, of the pension commission, as it were, uh, over time. Um, these have been assembled since the uh, 1950s <coughs> and updated and, and modified periodically. Um, but it does represent um, the the general approach that the pension commission has taken to to handling very various pension um, issues. Starting on page seven, start talking a little bit about um, how we got to uh, the number of pension plans and the the, the num the um, uh, particular um, pension plans that a exist currently. Um, Pension commissions, or I'm sorry, pension plans have existed in Minnesota um, since um, the mid 1800s, um, but the bulk of them have um, have actually been established um, in the 20th century. Um, the development of, of public pensions in Minnesota was, in effect, on, on a needs basis. Um, when an employee group um, petitioned that they should have pension coverage, then pension coverage was typically provided for that level or that type of public employee. Um, there's not been um, much uh, historically um, much attention in setting up pension plans to do things as comprehensively as we might have. And hence, Minnesota has the distinction of having the, the second largest number of public employee pension plans of the 50 states. Um, Pennsylvania exceeds the number of pension plans that Minnesota has. We have in the neighborhood of 800 pension plans. Um, Pennsylvania, last time I checked, is somewhere in excess of 3,000 uh, public employee pension plans. Um, I had the distinction of being um, an employee of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for four years in the 1980s and had um, firsthand experience in what a system with 3,000 pension plans looks like. Um, what we've, um, what has happened um, recently, in, in page um, page eight of the uh, document, gives you some some sense about um, some consolidations that have occurred. So, we have been restructuring uh, Minnesota pension plans o over time, um, simplifying the um, the number of public employee pension plans to uh, some degree. Um, Significantly, last session, the last of the police and paid fire pension plans in the state of Minnesota, these are local plans um, for one, one jurisdiction, um, the last of those plans merged with uh, PERA, so we, know we no longer have um, uh, local police or paid fire pension plans. Um, we once had about 50 of them. Um, on page nine, I've given you a list of the various pension plans that currently exist, the statewide plans and the local plans. I've broken them out into two component parts, um, defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans. This is the distinction about um, what is being promised and, and what is, is left to be determined um, over time. Defined benefit plans, um, specify how a pension benefit is going to be calculated. This is your typical formula plan. Um, in our plans, they're um, salary-based plans, so there is a, a, an average um, covered salary to which um, is applied a, a percentage benefit accrual rate for each year of, of service credit. That generates the, the uh, pension that's going to be paid to an individual at our, our retirement age. And what's left to be figured out is the actuarial requirements, what, what funding is, is needed to provide that, that level of promised benefits. To define contribution plans towards the bottom of the page are your typical IRA or 401k type plans. This, what is promised is at a given level of funding. 
what's left to be determined in the future is what benefits the pot of gold that um, is generated as a consequence will provide. So that gives you a sense of our, of our pension plans. Um, nine, pages 9, 10, 11 give you some sense about um, where these plans, when they were established, and if they're no longer with us, where, where they went. Um, on page 14, um, I've given you a list of the pension plans again, and I'm making the point here that um, there are, um, although we have a, a fair number of, of statewide pension plans, we have a somewhat limited number of pension plan administrations. You'll be hearing from the uh, five um, significant plan administrations uh, uh, tomorrow um, before your, your, your uh, committee. Um, so if you look at here, this is, it gives you the benefit plan on the far left-hand side in the second column from the left, the uh, entity that administers that pension plan, and you see a large number of our statewide plans are administered by the state retirement system. Um, the, um, some of the plans have their own pension fund. Others um, are, are commingled with, with another pension fund. And for our statewide plans, you're looking at the State Board of Investment as the investment authority. Page 15 and thereabouts gives you some sense about how our public pension plans are either specified or regulated. Um, for our pension plans, other than volunteer fire pension plans, and that's the largest number of our pension plans by, by absolute count, um, seven, 700 and some odd um, volunteer fire pension plans still exist. Um, for other than volunteer fire plans, the, the actual benefit plan that the, um, is set forth in statute. Um, so if there's going to be a change in the benefit formula, the retirement age, um, what constitutes a year of, of credited service, um, what's the definition of, of the salary base that's used for, for paying pension benefits, all that is in statute and any, any change uh, has to be made um, by, by legislation that comes uh, before you. Um, if you, for volunteer fire plans, um, there's a somewhat different approach. Um, the Minnesota is unique or relatively uh, uh, unique in having um, our local pension plans um, in the form of nonprofit corporations. Each of the volunteer fire uh, relief associations are, are an independent nonprofit fire, non, non, nonprofit corporation under Minnesota law. Um, they're not a municipal trust fund, they're not a municipal account, as would occur in Pennsylvania, for instance, um, but are, are, are a freestanding uh, corporate entity separate from, from the city that they serve. Um, we do not specify the, the pension benefits payable by each of the 700 plus volunteer fire plans. We do set certain minimums and certain maximums um, minimum age for retirement is typically 50, or is 50. Um, maximum benefit uh, um, is, is set forth. Um, other uh, requirements that are um, for uh, pension benefit from the volunteer fire plan may be specified or other limitations in, in, imposed. Um, Our plans, uh, if you turn to page 17, um, the federal income tax qualification issue, um, pension plans are regulated by the federal government to a greater or lesser extent. Um, public pension plans um, are exempt from some of the more onerous parts of, of federal uh, pension plan regulation um, as governmental plans. Um, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974 is the um, baseline federal law on, on pension plans and um, pension plans um, who are, that are qualified um, as uh, ex exempt organizations under the federal tax code um, have certain uh, advantages. Um, money can be transferred from tax exempt entities, uh, qualified pension plans um, without having any uh, taxable impact to the individual member. Um, our statewide plans all have a uh, determination letters. Our um, Internal Revenue Code section um, uh, 401 tax qualified plans 
um, it's less clear or um, less um, well defined about um, whether any of our or many of our volunteer fire plans have tax qualification letters. Um, Mr. Chair. Representative Kahn. Do you have a question on this specific issue right now? Or do you um, want to wait? We, we can go. We, you can ask the question, Representative Kahn. Okay. Uh, I don't remember this as an issue coming up. Have we ever discussed that in the Pension Commission, this tax qualification letter? And, and have these, you know, what's, what's the answer if this is a requirement and they're not Mr. doing it? Is uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'll represent Khan. Um, the issue doesn't come up very often before the Pension Commission. I, um, I remember maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it might have come up um, the, when the federal government on occasion decides to um, be more um, onerous in, in its regulation. Um, most of the time, um, there, there's enough for the Department of Labor and the Internal Revenue Service to do keeping track of of the um, hundreds of thousands of private sector pension plans, and they don't tend to get into uh, public pension plans. When it comes up, it's it's usually um, with respect to individuals who want to take their their lump sum volunteer fire pension and and move it into a uh, private investment when they uh, are retire, rather than than uh, having it be a uh, taxable event. And then it tends to come up, but it tends to come up on a local level. Um, recently, there has been some concern or some interest with respect to what um, forms have to be filed with the Internal Revenue Service. Um, and they're, they're the, the League of Cities um, and the State Auditor's Office have been working with the volunteer fire plans to resolve that issue. And I have heard about their workings, but I don't. I'm not a first-hand participant in in that, so either I think there is someone from the League of Cities here, and at some point there may it may be advisable to have someone from the State Auditor's Office give you some information on, on that beyond what I can provide. Uh, Jeff, is, is there any is there a good reason for the state to become proactive in this issue? I mean, we could even if it's a federal form, we could say, hey, you got to file it for some reason or another. Mr. Martin. Is um, Mr. Chair, Representative Kahn, um, it would always be well to, it would always be a good idea to, to have these pension plans run as straightforwardly and as streamlined and fully compliant as possible. Um, the problem with volunteer fire plans in particular is they are local administrations. You're talking about individuals who are presumably expert in their normal line of work, then it additionally have taken on the, the responsibility of being volunteer firefighters. And then beyond that, some of them have chosen to try and administer a uh, pension plan. So it's at, at their third level of expertise, perhaps. And you, there is a certain range of, of expertise that's actually on the ground. Um, people who are willing to spend the time and the effort to, to to run the volunteer fire plan um, as if it were their primary focus um, is probably pretty rare. Mr. Martin, proceed. Uh, members, um, I would next ask you to look at pages 19 and thereabouts. Um, I talked about actuarial uh, reporting in concept. Um, back before the Pension Commission was created in its much of its current form in, in the 50s, um, there was relatively little or no actuarial uh, reporting about our public employee uh, pension plans. Um, now regular actuarial work is provided. Um, um, and several of the next pages that I have for, for you will give you the most recent uh, results of the actuarial uh, 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 reporting. Um, you turn to page 21, um, give you a, a, a graph there. Um, actuarial valuations and actuarial funding is really just a budgeting tool. Um, public pension plans have the problem of having people earn a public pension over a certain period of their uh, lifetime, 
and then have it payable later um, over the balance of their lifetime. And um, you can fund these plans in a number of different ways. And the graph that you see here is gives you a sense of, of, of some of the alternatives. Um, there's something here called pay as you go on this graph. It's the, um, the uh, squares. And you can see that if you were funding this just based on what it took to to pay the pension benefits that are payable at any point in time, you would get a, a, a funding obligation that looked much like this, um, negligible in the first few years of the existence of a uh, pension plan, growing over time and finally stabilizing when you um, have a, a, a relatively stable um, a retiree base. Uh, but a, a growing uh, requirement for uh, funding over time. The version of funding that is utilized in uh, Minnesota is the entry age normal, which is the uh, circles um, that you see in this graph. The idea is to have um, the obligation to, be, to put aside money for public employee pensions on a, on a level basis over time, over the, the individual's working lifetime, to put it away as a percentage of, of covered, covered pay. Um, what you see here then is, is a, a level line during the, the first 20 years that's shown on, on this graph. Um, and this assumes that you have some unfunded pension liability, and that's why there's a, a change in the line. That's why the, the, the flat line drops off. Um, this is assuming if you had a 20-year amortization period, if you paid off the, the um, whatever unfunded that you, you, you had from uh, prior to establishing the plan when you recognize past service credit before the, the creation of the plan or whatever generates the unfunded, and then you pay it off, you would then again be um, back on, on, a, on a level contra contribution without the amortization contribution being their only normal cost. Um, so that's, that's the goal of the plan that um, has been utilized in Minnesota since the 1960s. Um, for interest, perhaps, um, there's something here called the aggregate method. It's the diamonds, which tends to start high and, and, and uh, trails off. This is um, the method, in effect, that's being used by our neighbor, Wisconsin. Um, they call it the f frozen initial liability method. but since they paid off that very small frozen initial liability that they had, um, what they're u really use, u u using is the aggregate method. And that says whatever you have in the bank, whatever assets you have accumulated, that's, your, that's equal to your accrued liability. And we're just going to throw all the rest of um, pension costs into um, uh, future contr contributions. Um, that method produces no unfunded liability. You've noticed in some of the national um, uh, summaries of, of the condition of, of uh, pension plans, um, one of the things um, the Pew folks come to mind right away, um, one of the things is they don't bother to tell you what the, what the actuarial method that's being used by each of the 50 states. You don't really know what, what numbers you're, you're uh, looking at. The other item is that they don't um, really tell you that um, the aggregate method produces no unfunded accrued liability. And if your measure is, is there an unfunded accrued, accrued liability or not, if that's a, a way to, to determine whether a, a state is doing well in its public pension plans, um, just by changing actuarial method and not doing anything else, you can make it look like you're doing better than, than um, the entry age normal method states look. Um, the entry age normal method is the most common among the 50 states, but it's, it's not used everywhere. The first um, of the numbers um, pages that I have for you um, start on, on page 23, um, and this is a, a summary of all of our public pension plans for the whole state, um, and I'll, I'll um, explain to you uh, what to look at to get some sense about what is, is what you're actually able to uh, learn from from this pile of uh, numbers um, I've, I've categorized or, or grouped uh, plans to, uh, together um, by their their general type 
So the first um, box of uh, numbers on the left-hand side is the uh, statewide general employee plans. These are the three major uh, pension plans that you're probably most familiar with. This is the uh, state employees uh, retirement plan, the, the PERA plan, and the statewide teachers plan. Other plans um, like the, the statewide public safety plans, um, the first class city teacher plans, um, the volunteer fire plans are all in, in subsequent columns. Um, I give you membership information up on the top, uh, a word that you might not be familiar with, uh, deferred retirees. These are folks who are who have enough service credit in the plan before they uh, terminated to vest for a, uh, ben a uh, pension benefit, have left their money with the plan and will get eventually a uh, pension benefit, but they're not active members at the moment. Another uh, category item, um, non-vested former members. These are folks who um, have made, uh, have had uh, service credit covered by the the uh, pension plan, have made contributions, have not taken a refund of their contributions, but don't have enough service to vest in that particular pension plan, but have left their money with the plan. So you've got categories of, of membership um, up on top. The funding status, the accrued liability is what the pension plan, the, that portion of the present value of future benefits that the pension plan currently owes. Then there's something called current assets. This is the uh, actuarial value of assets. Uh, Minnesota uses a, a method of, of, de of de uh, determining asset values that um, blends or, or um, 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 factors out some of the volatility in the asset numbers. Um, so you're, you're, we're using a, um, something that's derived from the market value of assets, but take some of the volatility that would be in the market value of assets out of the number. And the difference between those two numbers is the unfunded pension liability and that produces the funding ratio. And for our statewide, um, total statewide general employee plans, the the funding ratio is just over 75 percent. means we have um, three quarters of all the money that we should have in the bank right now under our actuarial method actually in the bank. Next set of numbers is covered payroll and the benefits payable. Um, this is the, act the, um, the total salaries of all the people covered by the plan is covered payroll and the benefits payable is the um, annual annuities that are uh, payable out of the plan. Our Actuarial method produces something called normal cost. Normal cost is the value of the pension coverage for active members not paying any attention to the unfunded pension liability if there is any. The administrative expenses is what it costs to run the pension plan. Um, the amortization contribution is the debt service on the, the unfunded pension liability. Um, in Minnesota, we don't um, amortize unfunded pension liabilities as you might pay off a house mortgage, um, which is the le is a level dollar um, um, amortization method. We use a level percentage of an increasing covered payroll method. What that does is um, it levels out from a from a financing and funding standpoint um, our our contributions over time and doesn't overtax one generation um, as compared to another um, on a percentage basis. But it, it, during the early years of the amortization period, doesn't pay the full interest on, on the unfunded. So um, it's, a, it's an amortization period, but it does have built into it um, some ballooning of, of the ultimate pension, ultimate amortization payments that are uh, needed. And towards the bottom of the, the set of numbers is the uh, contributions and or state aid uh, that comes to the plan. On the very bottom is the total requirements versus total contributions, or how do are we um, putting enough in this year to our pension plans? Um, if there's a deficiency, it's um, not in brackets. If there is a surplus, um, it would be in uh, brackets. Most of our pension plans have a deficiency. We're not our contribution levels are are lower than our um, actuarial cost levels, um, and that's um, a potential problem. Um, the succeeding pages that I have for you, 24 and so on, um, are the fund-specific information, the same information 
um, that's presented on, on the fire page, but for a particular pension plan um, or a group of uh, 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 pension plans. And you can run through those um, as you see fit. On page 29, I try and give you some historic sensibility about funding in Minnesota. Um, it's the funding progress from 57 to 2012. Um, it gives you the snapshot view of um, the MSRS general plan, the three major plans, and the St. Paul teachers plan, and all Minnesota public pension plans grouped together for some snapshot periods, um, 57, 75, 92, and 2012. Just to give you an idea, um, are we better, worse, where are we? Um, and you can get a, get a, get a sense that, um, of, the con of the continuity of our results. You can look at the, while well, the dollar amounts have changed considerably, um, the, the contributions and the, the funding requirements um, haven't been as, as uh, dramatically changing over time. <coughs> pages 31 and, and for several more pages are um, some uh, charts that um, give you some sense about um, funding ratios, um, normal cost um, contribution levels, um, showing you um, historically o over time in a, in a graphic way uh, that might be of interest to you. Page 47, and for the next several pages, I have some information on the, the demographics of, of our pension plans. Um, pension costs are, are a function of the benefit plan, what you're promising, and the people to whom you're promising it. And um, this gives you some I idea of um, what the people in our public pension plans look like over time. Um, I have information for selected years. Um, and then 2012, so 1985, 90, 95, 2000, 2005, 2010. Um, how many people, what's their average age, their average covered salary, their average length of uh, service, um, that sort of information um, that may be of interest to you. On page 55 and 56, 57, there's some information on gains and losses. Um, the, as part of the actuarial evaluation process, the, the actuary um, tries to figure out why the unfunded pension liability went up or down um, and um, looks at um, what might be producing increases or decreases in the, the unfunded accrued liability. Um, because we assume that salaries are growing at a certain level, we assume that we're going to get investment income of a, of a certain level, um, that uh, people die at a certain time. Um, we have um, actuarial assumptions um, that are used by the actuary, um, and to the extent that there are deviations from, from those actuarial assumptions, they're either gains or losses. And this gives you a, a compendium, a sense of the, the magnitude of gains and losses in, in the the relative experience, um, positive or negative, o over time. Page 59 has to do with post-retirement increases. Our pension plans um, generally include, as part of their uh, pension plan, at least the uh, statewide plans and the major local plans, um, post-retirement in increases. And this is, this sheet gives you um, the um, a, a sense of the post-retirement in increases payable over time. Um, to our um, various plans. Um, they're grouped together by uh, who administers the plan, so the, all the MSRS plans um, are, are, are set forth in one column, all the PERA covered plans are, are set forth in another column, and then the uh, various teacher plans. On page 61 is some information about investment returns. Um, if in a well-funded pension plan, a plan that's funded according to actuarial principles, um, something in the neighborhood of, of three-quarters of the ultimate payout from the pension plan is going to be generated by the investment program. Um, contributions will be the other 20, 25 percent or thereabouts. 
Um, and so investments is a very important part of what's going on in uh, uh, public pension plans. This gives you some information about the um, investment returns of the State Board of Investments, which is the first um, broad column here. Um, and it um, gives you, uh, compares those numbers with um, the uh, major local plans, um, the former Minnesota, former Minneapolis Teachers Plan, Duluth Teachers, St. Paul Teachers, and the former MRF. So this gives you some sense. These are calendar year rates of return, so it's um, where the numbers are, are here, or the 2012 numbers are, are good for the end of, of, of 2012. You can see some volatility in these numbers. I would draw your attention to 2008. Um, 2008 was a very bad year for public pension plans and all other uh, pen, all other pension plans. This is part of the great our, the impact of the Great Recession of 2008. Um, and um, the State Board of Investment had a 26 percent loss. Um, that was worse than the first class city teacher plans. On page 63, um, I have some, some information. Um, it's really an update item. It's something I did a couple years ago. Um, in 2010, to address the um, problem, the funding problems, the financing problems created by the Great Recession of 2008, uh, the le legislation was enacted that uh, modified, downsized our, uh, a number of our public employee uh, pension plan promises. Um, in many cases, um, post-retirement increases were reduced or, or not paid for, for a period of time. Um, vesting requirements were increased in some cases. Other changes made. Um, and pages 63, 64, 65 um, try and give you a, a sense of um, what the impact of that 2010 um, uh, benefit change bill um, had on the unfunded uh, pension liabilities of our pension plans. On page 66 and 67, um, I've tried to give you some sense of what it did to, um, um, I'm sorry, on, on page 67, 66 and 67, I've given you some um, sense about what the um, uh, impact was on um, normal cost and what um, help or, or um, change was made in, in contribution rates. The 2010 piece of legislation also increased contribution rates by um, public employees um, considerably um, in some cases and um, many of those contribution rate increases were phased in over time. So this tries to give you some, some sense about what um, the costs of the plan look like as, as compared to the, the uh, modified contribution rates. Starting on page 69 and for the balance of, of the document, I've, I've given you some narrative about some um, pension problems that um, either will come up or might come up over the next biennium. Um, I think I'll spend most of my time here um, talking about the, the first one, which is the um, contribution rates, the contribution uh, deficiency. Um, many of our plans have contribution uh, deficiencies, um, and some of them are growing to be quite serious. Um, Whether it's time to panic or not is um, a judgment call um, at some point. Well, I think it would be wise for this committee, um, if you're interested about um, the contribution rate issue, um, one of the fat, one of the information sources or two of the information sources that you probably ought to uh, contemplate hearing from is the State Board of Investment and the state economist. Um, what's going to happen in our public pension plans is largely going to be driven by the economy and by the investment markets. Um, and whether this is um, a, a temporary um, uh, bad period that's going to be reversed by future economic gains and investment performance or not is something I can't tell you 
with any any assurity. Uh, it's not something I take a look at or uh, prognosticate about. But the State Board of Investment does gather information from its investment advisors as to their outlook for the for the next decade or so, and they can give you some some sense about where they see things going. And the state economist um, can presumably give you some sense about what's going on in in the in the state economy, in the national economy, and and what that may port portend. If we're um, going to fall into a double dip a recession, um, that's going to make things very very difficult. If we stay stagnant as we are right now, we're also going to have a, a less difficult but still difficult period. If there is going to be um, a, a um, a uh, somewhat vigorous recovery at any, any time future, um, and a, a, a shifting from a bear markets to to bull markets in the investment markets, things that we're currently concerned about will be much less um, uh, worthy of, of, of panic um, than they are right now. Um, to give you a sense about how bad things might be or could could get. Um, if you could turn to page 26 of, of your document and look at the judge's plan, which is the plan. I pick on the judge's plan only because it's, it's the worst case scenario, perhaps. Um, it's in the middle of the set of numbers there. Um, this is a small plan, uh, covers only 300 or so active, active members. Um, it's a plan that was set up relatively late. Uh, it was created in 1973 to replace uh, five other pension plans that related to judges or judges survivors. Um, it was only put on a full funding uh, basis in 1990, um, so it, it suffers from not having a long uh, tradition of, of uh, adequate funding. But if you um, look at the, the funded status first, the funding ratio, which is the about a third of the way down down the page, you see that this plan is is 51 percent uh, funded. Um, so it's only have it only has assets slightly um, greater than one half of its pension liabilities. Um, has um, total requirements for the pension plan um, to uh, fund it adequately of in the neighborhood of 42 percent of pay, and its current contributions are 28 percent of pay leaving a 13.5% of pay deficiency. Um, this is a, a fairly significant uh, shortfall um, and um, may need to uh, be addressed. I am told, and you can, when Mr. Bergstrom from the State Retirement System testifies tomorrow, it's my understanding that, that there is um, some mo movement in looking at making some modifications in the judge's plan to address, to reduce the liabilities of the plan, to reduce the, the, the funding uh, requirements of the plan to some degree. What exactly is entailed, I have no idea, but I'm, I'm told that there is some, some interest in, in the part of um, the uh, pension plan and, and the participants in that plan to, um, to try and find some accommodations. Judges, of course, have their compensation guaranteed um, not to be diminished in the state constitution, um, so chain and judges have ruled in the past that pension coverage is part of their compensation and cannot be diminished. So, the latitude of the legislature to address the uh, judges' plan is 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 less than it is in perhaps other public employee sectors. But also have you take a look, if you would, at page 25, the preceding page. Um, the um, state patrol plan and the PERA police and fire plan also have fairly significant um, contribution uh, deficiencies. Um, and it's my understanding that uh, employee groups in both of those pension plans are, uh, have actively been, been working to um, uh, undertake some benefit modifications that may produce smaller costs there. Mr. Bergstrom, with respect to the state patrol plan, that's administered by MSRS, and Ms. Vanek, Mary Vanek, uh, with respect to PERA police and fire, administered by PERA, uh, tomorrow can be telling you a bit about what, what's entailed there. Um, when you're facing a, a funding problem, there are only really a couple of things you can do. You can 
reduce the amount of promises made or even increase the amount of contributions being made or both. Um, you can hope for better well, investment performance. Oh, Representative Kahn. But, but doesn't that contradict the thing that you earlier said, which was that three quarters of the funding of a pension plan comes from their investments? Oh, sure. Mr. Chairman, Rep Representative Kahn, um, there was a, a preparatory part of that statement, which is in a pension plan that's funded on a full actuarial basis, 75% of the money comes from investments. If you put the money in during a person's working lifetime, then it's there to grow and produce that 75% of the total outlay. Um, if you're not funding your plan adequately, it's not going to produce 75% of the eventual outlay from investments because there's not going to be the asset base there. Representative Kahn? It would still seem to me it would still be 75. If the investments are 75%, it's 75% of a higher or lower number. But I would think the 75% would still, in a whole, obviously over a long run, not in a year or two or away. I remember we, we were complaining about some of the funds that had all of their money in cash in local banks. And unfortunately, if you, I think I was really wanting to look at that in 2008, and unfortunately in 2008 they all looked like geniuses. <laughs> they all had, but you know, no one would say that investing in cash in a local bank is a really good investment strategy for the long run. Mr. Martin. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 Mr. Chair, Rep Representative Kahn, what you're thinking of perhaps um, is, is more the defined contributions setting where, where the, the pot of gold is the benefit. Um, when we have a defined benefit plan, though, you, you've defined what's going to be paid out, and you have to find a way to fund that. And the money has, if you don't have it coming in while a person is, is actively working, it's not going to be there to generate investment performance. You turn to, turn to page 26 again and look at the legislator's plan or look at the elected state officer's plan. They're examples of plans that are not being funded on an actuarial basis. Um, and you can see, uh, if you look at the assets of those plans, it's, um, they're either zero or uh, essentially zero. Um, the elective state officer's plan has never been funded on, on an actuarial basis. It's also been closed to new entrants back in 1997 and um, um, will not exist at some point in the future when the, the current uh, our, our recipients uh, of the plan um, eventually die. The legislator's plan has also been, been placed on a, on a phase-out basis in 1997. It once was funded on a closer to an actuarial funding basis and it was shifted um, earlier in the 2000s, um, um, when former Representative McElroy was finance commissioner, it was a recommendation of the the finance department to to uh, shift to a pay-as-you-go rather than any version of a of an actuarial funding basis. There there are no assets to speak of to generate investment income. Seventy-five percent of the outlay to the legislature's plan is not going to come from investments um, because the money is not there. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that was a distinct decision that was made because the legit, the number, when you compare to the general population, the number of legislators that have to be funded through pensions is pretty small at any time. And it was, I, I, the decision was made that that could best be handled by annual appropriations instead of an actually funded plan. Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Martin. Uh, Representative Kahn, it, I'm, I'm not criticizing yeah. the decision per se. Um, I'm just noting that it, it, it sure. happened. Um, the Prior to the early 2000s, uh, the legislative plan was funded on what's known as a, a terminal basis. That is that the state budget, the yeah. state general fund appropriated uh, at the time a legislator retired the entirety <coughs> of their present value of future benefits. So, in effect, in effect, no contribution was made by the state during a legislator's working lifetime. When the legislator chose to retire, the entirety of that, what would have been contributed in all those years, is made in one lump sum. 
that led to a very raucous, um, very bouncy um, um, level of, of contributions. It wasn't stable at all. Um, it also, with several legislators retiring, was also going to be very, very large um, when when the change was 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 made. Uh, going to a pay as you go makes it a, a more stable, a more predictable year to year um, financing question, but it also gives up any possibility of investment performance paying any significant portion of, of the ultimate pension obligations paid by the, the uh, pension plan. Mr. Martin, and if you were talking about there were limited options we can do to increase the funding of the plan, so if we can right. go back. Um, if um, we're going to, a, if um, our funding is really at a crisis um, and it's not going to be resolved by uh, the economy turning around and the investment markets turn, turning around, um, if we're going to meet our promises, we're going to have to do uh, one or a combination of, uh, of those things, uh, increase contributions or, or reduce benefits or both. Um, that's why I was suggesting at some point you might want to have the State Board of Investment and, and the, the uh, State Economist appear um, to give you some assurance or some sense about um, what course of action we're on. If things aren't going to get much better in the economy over the long term, um, the longer we wait hoping that they will turn better, um, we're going to lose valuable time. Um, if they're going to be bad news, we better start making contributions at, at higher levels um, and doing it as early as we possibly can. If things are going to get better, then um, this is of attention. It, this should merit your attention, but um, concern um, close to panic is, is not yet I would not yet be appropriate. So that's why I suggest um, some further testimony by by the State Board and, and by the uh, State Economist. Thank you. Uh, Representative Draskowski, you had a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, Mr. Martin, uh, I'm just looking for the total unfunded liability number. I believe it's page 23. Is that the $16.66 .66 billion? And, uh, and if it is, I'm curious, is there a is there a table in here that shows that unfunded liability number over time, or is there a place we can go to find that as well? Mr. Martin. <clears throat> there's not a, a place, uh, 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 yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, there's not a place in this packet right here um, that, that shows you that. Um, the Commission's website, um, if you go to just Google LCPR, um, there there is some under the reports um, section of, of, of the website, there there is this kind of information for numerous years back. Um, we also have individual funding information um, all the way back to the first actuarial evaluations for each of our public pension plans um, set forth in, in tables on the website. And I'll send you a link to those. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Um, that would conclude my presentation. Happy to answer questions if there's time available. Is there any more questions that we'd like to ask Mr. Martin? Yeah. Representative Kahn. Uh, we've had this continuing conversation, and one of the things you, and the examples that we are always given of the really deficient pension plans or things like Northwest and so forth, which are private entities. Uh, the thing that, uh, I, that I've always said, and of course I never know how well we're tracking on it or not, is that it doesn't make any sense to have a future date that a plan has to be fully funded for public employees, because we know we're always going to have police. We're always going to have. What I'm concerned about is how we're tracking in terms of money coming in and also being in the investment returns and meeting our obligations on a day-to-day -day basis. Do when, when does the first crisis in and, you know, I know there was some that we took and slightly averted, like Murph and Minneapolis teachers and so forth, but when when is that day coming when we're going to really worry that we have pension checks that can't 
we, we have pension checks that are supposed to come out, go out this year, and we can't put them out. Mr. Martin. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Representative Khan, um, I think the thing to do is, is to take a look at, um, there is no one date that I can, I can give you. Um, each plan will, if it's going to potentially default, uh, will be potentially defaulting at a different date than the other plans. Um, well, if the you earliest take a look plan. at the, on any of the charts, if you look on, on page 24, for instance, I um, include in this chart uh, the, the benefits payable line. Um, it's the uh, current annual um, payout from that pension plan. Um, it's right in the middle of, of the page, right under yeah. uh, covered payroll. Um, if you look at that and compare that to the current assets, you start to get some flavor of the drawdown. Um, it's not a very sophisticated way of looking at it. Um, what you need to do is also look at the contribution rates coming in. Um, you have the, the date that you're going to default is when the, um, that benefits payable line exceeds the current assets plus the annual contributions. Um, there are projections that are required as part of our actuarial valuations um, that do look at this question about um, the, the, the relative strength of, of our funding as compared to our payouts. Um, that's harder to capture in these charts, um, but it, it does exist. Um, it's a, a, a recent addition, um, something that, that uh, the Commission added to the standards for actuarial work in 2010. Does that answer your question? I don't think so. But <laughs> Representative Schalski. I think the information was there if I could open Thank you, Mr. Chair. Related to Representative Kahn's question, Mr. Martin, what are the next funds that are going to be approaching insolvency? Mr. Martin. Insolvency. Um, insolvency. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, um, Representative, I think um, the judge's plan has clearly got a problem. Um, that's the least well-funded of our pension plans. It's not an immediate issue. It's benefit payout is, is 18 million a year and it has 144 million in current assets and 11 million in, in, in contributions. So it's, it's going to draw that down by about 7 million a year. So it's, we're looking in the neighborhood of 20 years out um, just on the raw numbers that I'm looking at here. So it's probably the first one. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Martin, uh, so the, the legislator's one doesn't look too good either, but I realize it's a very small potato. The legislator's plan, uh, yes. Mr. Martin. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll represent, uh, the legislator's plan and the elective state officer's plan are, are on a pay-as-you-go. Um, there's an open and standing appropriation for whatever the, the benefit payout is. So they're not going to default um, on their benefit payments. Um, because of the statutory structure that they have an open standing. Um, and they were consciously put on a, on a page of go basis. Um, the judge's plan was we have been trying to fund those on, on an actuarial basis. Um, and they're not, there is no open and standing backup on, on them um, in statute currently. I would expect that the first day that a judge doesn't receive, a retired judge doesn't <laughs> receive a uh, pension benefit that something will happen to um, create what would in effect be an open and standing appropriation um, under the, ju the judges have a no diminution of, of compensation provision in the state constitution. Um, if they don't get paid a pension benefit, they have a constitutional right to come in and, and demand one. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Martin. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Martin. For the legislator pensions, I saw that there's 34 active members. Are those the legislators that have that were first elected before 1998? Are there 30? Is that who it is? So then, Mr. Chair, yes, um, that's the folks as of July um, of 2012 um, that were still remaining of, of that pre-1997 group. The close-off date was July 1, 1997. Um, 
there would be some uh, the active membership of that plan will be somewhat smaller now because some folks either didn't win re-election or, or or didn't announce their retirement until after the um, June 30 date that this valuation is based on. The balance of legislators who are not in the legislators plan are, are in the unclassified plan, which is a defined contr cont cont contribution plan for, for legislators. Um, there is no unfunded pension liability. That's like an IRA or 401k plan. The, um, the contributions are, are what's promised, not a given level of benefits. Representative Pepper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Martin, so what, what, would, what would happen with the unfunded liability if all 34 active members did not run for re-election in two years? Therefore, there'd be zero active members and over 300 uh, in a, or inactive members who are promised a pension. What, what would be the result of that? I'm, cu I'm curious because at some point all of these active members are going to be inactive former members and there's still going to be a pension liability. Mr. Martin. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative, um, the, the benefits payable line is going to grow to some degree. Um, it depends upon how many of the current 34 legislators are, are age 60 or older and can start drawing immediate pension benefits or whether they're going to be uh, deferred for some period of time. I haven't looked at, at the, this particular population recently enough to, to remember. Um, but the, the benefits payable line is going to go up. There will be no contribution line left. Um, and <coughs> the fairly limited number of assets that are, are in this plan are going to be odd, odd depleted very, very quickly. Um, and the, the pay-as-you-go obligation will grow um, for the state general fund. Representative Pepper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Martin, what is the, it's a defined pension plan, so is, what is the average pension for, uh, for legislators that fall into this category? And did you say that they start, they can start um, getting their pension at age 60? Is that correct? Mr. Martin. Um, yes, yeah, Mr. Chair. I'm representative. The earliest age that a legislator can draw their benefit, a reduced benefit is, is 60. Um, full benefits will be payable at 62 um, in the old legislator's plan. Um, the give you a sense of the average um, benefit payable from the legislator's plan. If you look on page 50, um, where I have some the demographic information, um, the average benefit payable by the various pension plans is on the bottom of, of page 50. And for the legislator's plan, um, the average annual benefit right now is, is $22,200. This would be the 2012 column and the legislators is about the middle of that bottom chunk of uh, numbers. Six lines up from the bottom. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Representative Skalski. One here. quick one, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Martin, that, uh, that open, uh, what did you call it, the open payment to pay open the standing? open and standing uh, uh, pay as you go, uh, how, how many uh, pension funds uh, do we have in that situation? Is there a place I can look to see where those are and, and the place in the general fund that those, uh, those funds appear? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative, the, um, only the elective state officers and the constitutional officers have an open and standing appropriation I'm aware of. Um, the open and standing appropriation language for the legislators would be in Chapter 3A, um, somewhere around 3A.02, Section 0 0.302 towards the end of that section. And then there's also one later in 3A.03, .03, 3A related to survivor benefits um, in, for the, um, the elective state officers. It's in 352C as in Charlie. Um, that may actually send you back to an old, um, a, a no longer printed um, section of statute. Um, there are some open and standing appropriations in the pension area related to state aids. Um, for instance, police state aid, fire state aid, um, 
the police state aid, for instance, um, give you a sense of um, our state aids. It's a, a topic that I, I do discuss in, in the in the packet. I don't know if you um, go to page 77. Um, I have a listing of all the various state aids that are payable related to uh, pensions, and several of those have open and standing appropriations. Police state aid is money coming from automobile casualty insurance premium taxes and is redistributed um, to municipalities to help offset their employer pension costs for uh, police officers. Fire state aid is the proceeds of the insurance premium tax on fire insurance and is given to, to fire departments to offset the cost of uh, fire, fire pensions. The amortization uh, aids that you see, there are three of them there, are, are either open and standing or they derive from open and standing appropriations. Um, the PERA um, aid is also an open and standing. Um, so several of these. Um, some are in the jurisdiction of the State Government Finance Division and some are in the jurisdiction of the, the uh, Tax Committee. Um, the police and fire state aid, the amortization aids are um, in the tax committee. Um, the MRF um, open and standing appropriation, the Minneapolis, te the old Minneapolis teacher TRA, Duluth teacher St. Paul teacher aids are are in this, are in the state government finance division um, area. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Um, before we, we adjourn, I'd like the pages to introduce themselves. These are going to be the pages that are going to be with us. I, I neglected to do that earlier. Just just stand up. Yeah, stay here. Hi, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Will Ishii. I uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota uh, in 2011 um, in political science. I uh, interned in both the House or er, the Senate and the governor's office um, and I joined the guard a year ago um, and just got back from basic training this last summer so happy to be here and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you chair uh, my name is Nasir and I'm the product of two continents uh, I was born in uh, the Horn of Africa and I grew up there and uh, educated in Minnesota and um, uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota with political science and sociology of law and African studies and now I'm here so I'm so happy to be here thank you and uh, um, thanks everybody for paying attention and, and that was a rather dry subject that we had today we will continue this at our next meeting and just a reminder that our next meeting on Wednesday will be in the basement hearing room and with that the meeting is adjourned thank you.